When the Mupples Are Ripe From Yellow Mupples in Mafeking Road by Herman Charles Bosman I shall never forget the scene of our departure in front of the Feldkornet's house in the early morning when there were still shadows on the ranta and a thin wind blew through the grass. We had no predicant there, but an odorling with two bandoliers slung across his body and a martini in his hand said a few words. He was a strong and simple man with no great gifts of oratory, but when he spoke about the Transvaal, we could feel what was in his heart, and we took off our hats in silence. It was not long afterwards that I again took off my hat in much the same way. Then it was at my Yuba Hill. It was after the battle, and the Oderling still had two bandoliers around him when we buried him at the foot of the kopi. But what impressed me most was the prayer that followed the Oderling's brief address. In front of the Feldkornet's house we knelt, each burger with a rifle at his side, and the woman folk knelt down with us, and the wind seemed very gentle as it stirred the tall grass blades, very gentle as it swept over the bared heads of the men and fluttered the cuppies and skirts of the woman, very gentle as it carried the prayers of our nation across the felt. After that we stood up and sang a hymn. The ceremony was over. The Achterreiers brought our horses, and dry-eyed and tight-lipped, each woman sent her man forth to war. There was no weeping. Then, in accordance with Boer custom, we fired a volley into the air. Forwards, burghers! came the Feldkornet's order, and we cantered down the road in twos. Before we left, I had overheard Neil Spotgitter saying something to Martha Rousseau as he leant out of the saddle and kissed her. My sister Annie, standing beside my horse, also heard this. When the mooples are ripe, Martha, he said, I will come to you again. Annie and I looked at each other and smiled. It was a pretty thing, Niels had said, but then Marta was also pretty. More pretty even than the felt trees that bore those yellow mupples, I reflected, and more wild even too. I was thinking of this when our commando passed over the belt in a long line on our way south towards Natal, and the other commandos, and Mayuba. All the time I was on commando, I received only one letter. It came from Annie, my sister. Annie said, at the end of her letter, that she and Martha Rousseau had been to see a witch doctor. They had gone to find out about Neil Spotgitter and me. If I had been at home, I would not have permitted Annie to indulge in this nonsense, especially as the witch doctor had said to her, Yes, Mrs. I can see Buzz Scout Lawrence. He will come back safe. He is a very clever Buzz Scout. He lies behind a big stone with a dirty brown blanket pulled over his head and he stays behind the stone until the fighting is finished, quite finished. According to Annie's letter, the witch doctor had told her a few other things about me too. I won't bother to repeat them now. I think I've said enough to show you what a sort of a scoundrel that old witch doctor was. He took advantage of the credulity of a simple girl but he also tried to be funny 
at the expense of a young man who was fighting for his country's freedom. What was more, Annie said she had recognized that it was me right away, just from the witch doctor's description of that blanket. To Marta so, the witch doctor had said, Bas Neil Spotkite will come back to you, missus, when the mooples are ripe again. At sundown he will come. That was all he had said about Niels. And there wasn't very much in that anyway. Seeing that Niels himself, except for the bit about the sunset, had made the very same prophecy the day the commando had set out. I suppose the witch doctor had been too busy thinking out foolish and spiteful things about me to be able to give any proper attention to Niels Potgitter's affairs. I didn't mention Annie's letter to Niels. He might have wanted to know more than I was willing to tell him. More even than Martha was willing to tell him. Martha of the wild heart. Then at last the war ended, and over the Transvaal the Fierkler waved again. The commanders went home by their different ways, and our leaders revived their old quarrels as to who should be president. And everywhere except for a number of lonely graves on hillside and flutter, things were as they had been before Sir Theophilus Shepston had come. It was getting on towards evening when our small band rode over the belt and once more came to a halt at the Feltconet's house. A messenger had been sent in advance to announce our coming, and women and children and old men had gathered from afar to welcome their victorious burghers home from the war. And there were tears in many eyes when we sang, F. Burgers Hef, and the mooples were ripe and yellow on the trees. And in the dusk, Neil Spotgitter found Marta Rousseau and kissed her. At sundown, as the witch doctor had said, but there was one important thing that the witch doctor had not said. It was something that Neil Spotgitter did not know either just then. It was that Martha did not want him anymore.